Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the workshop in the History of Material Text. I'm Zach Lesser, a professor in English, and I co-direct the seminar with John Pollock of the Kislak Center. Hello. And Jerry Singerman of the Penn Press. Hello, everyone. And of course, our, our founding director, Peter Stallybrass, is here, I see. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed our our little break. Um, I think we've reached the burnout point during this bizarre semester, at least I have. So I'm glad to be back with this group, which is always uh, reinvigorating for me. And when we planned this session, um, we were all thinking how lucky we are that Michael uh, Winship had decided to move to Philadelphia after retiring from the University of Texas. But of course, now no one really is anywhere, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to, to benefiting from Michael's expertise even after we return to meeting in person. And I'm sure we'll all say how lucky we are to have him in Philly at that point. Um, Michael is the Iris Howard Regents Professor in English Emeritus at the University of Texas. He received his PhD from Oxford in 1990, where he was supervised by D.F. McKenzie. In addition to his long tenure at Texas, he teaches descriptive bibliography and American book history at the Rare Book School. And before its closure, he taught regularly at Columbia School of Library Service, where I noticed he once led a course on um, US book history with another Philadelphia book world legend, Edwin Wolfe. Michael's publications are in that tradition of monumental works of bibliography descending from the new bibliographers of the early 20th century. He was part of the editorial team that created the History of the Book in America, and he co-edited volume three of that series, which covered the period 1840 to 1880, and which won the St. Louis Mercantile Library Prize from the Bibliographical Society of America. And he also edited and completed the final three volumes of the Bibliography of American Literature, and he won the Bibliography Prize from um, the ILAB for that work. John Pollock tells me that in his email address, bal at austin.texas.edu, the BAL stands for Bibliography of American Literature. So this is real dedication to his work, allowing his own identity to be completely subsumed into the text. Michael has also worked extensively on Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin. And his first book was a study of Stowe's publisher, along with many other great American authors, Tickner and Fields. In 1997, in an event that I can only think must have involved time travel, he won the Individual Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Printing History Association. In short, Michael is one of our leading experts in the field of bibliography and American book history, and we're delighted to welcome him to the seminar to discuss Frederick Douglass's My Bondage and My Freedom. Welcome, Michael. There I am. Um, thank you, Zach. I, I'm actually standing in for that person that Zach introduced, but I'm happy to be here. I see many old friends here, uh, and I'm very happy to be back at the Material Text Seminar. Uh, I should also, while I'm thanking people, uh, mention Kathy Baker, whose PhD dissertation alerted me to the subject tonight's talk and whose work I rely on extensively for that. And of course, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I guess it's false spring, but it seems very bright and sunny having lost an hour of sleep at this hour. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, my talk tonight is part of a group of case studies that I've been doing for several decades. And these relate um, on gathering the publication history of a number of 19th century literary works, many of which are canonical and very well known, but they attracted my attention because uh, there are aspects of their history of publication that um, puzzled me or didn't seem quite right or make sense to me. Uh, and I found that once I started investigating them, they opened up all kinds of interesting questions. Uh, 
and not necessarily provided answers, but set, gave us new perspectives of thinking about them. And I've used over the years, these case studies, this work, uh, mainly in classes and seminars with undergraduates and graduates in a course that I call Producing American Literature. Um, some of them have been written up and presented at conferences and only a few actually have ever appeared in print. And I've always thought that someday, perhaps now I'm retired, I'd gather them together, revise them and put them into a book as uh, which would be called Producing American Literature. So uh, today I'm going to draw on part of the work that I've done over the past, gosh, it must be almost 10 years now on Frederick Douglass's uh, my Bondage and My Freedom. Uh, and this is, I gave a paper for Eleanor Shevlin some years ago on a completely different aspect of this work. Uh, and uh, I, hope it, I hope that you will in the conversation afterwards lead me into further ideas of how to put it together into something useful. Uh, to start, let me share my screen if I can manage. Okay. Hang on a minute. I have to, I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Okay. So, oops, and let me go back. Okay, there we are. So the title for today's talk comes from an advertisement that appeared in the New York Daily Tribune on the 30th of, of August, 1856. If the headline fails to catch your attention, the remainder of the advertisement, there is the advertisement, uh, is scarcely less incendiary. The penalty in Alabama is death for selling my bondage and my freedom by Frederick Douglass. And for this foul crime, two booksellers of Mobile have fled for their lives. Yet thanks to the genius of Northern Liberty, the book is yet freely offered and largely sold by every Northern bookseller and will yet, we trust, be found in every free home throughout our land, even in disenthralled Kansas and free Kansas. Death for selling such a book. To what horrid and infamous depth can man descend? Freeman, read the book that you may appreciate the offenses for which two American citizens may be hung. Northern booksellers and agents not having the fear of Southern vigilance committees before their eyes will continue to sell my bondage and my freedom. With this extraordinary advertisement, Miller, Orton, and Mulligan, publishers of New York and Auburn, were attempting to push the sale of Frederick, Frederick Douglass's second autobiographical account of his life. As both slave and freedman in the antebellum United States, that book, which had been published just over a year earlier, had enjoyed a remarkable success due in part to an aggressive ad advertising campaign by the publishers with a sale of 5,000 copies in two days and 10,000 in the first month. By the end of 1855, 15,000 copies were in print. In summer of 1856, as the newly established Republican Partly Party emerged as a political force for anti-slavery, um, excuse me, I'm having, there we are. 
for anti-slavery and free, free soil during the presidential election of that fall, the work was listed in advertisements as among the popular and standard Republican books that all supporters should purchase. Another 2,000 were produced. The advertisement refers to an incident that must have also have helped to boost sales of the work. The expulsion of booksellers William Strickland and Edwin Upson from Mobile, Alabama for vending incendiary books. Indeed, a notice in a New Orleans newspaper confidently asserted that my bondage and my freedom, a most infamous publication, has been privately sold by these parties to slaves. The incident has not gone completely unnoticed by modern scholars, but none to my knowledge has given a full account, although the whole is unusually well documented. It has much to tell us, I believe, about the circulation of print and books, especially anti-slavery works in the South at a time when mounting tensions over slavery were in the process of leading the county towards civil war. Remember, not only was a hotly contested presidential election going on, but only a few months earlier in May, <clears throat> Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina had found it necessary to uphold Southern honor by savagely caning Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate chamber. The mobile book selling establishment of Strickland and Co was an important one. Indeed, Strickland would later claim it was the largest and most profitable book and stationery business in the South. In addition to his book and stationery business, Strickland was also involved in managing a bindery, a job printing establishment, and a paper warehouse. He also served as agent for White's Type Foundry and R. Ho and Company, both based in New York. He was also doing some publishing in a minor way. Neither of the firm's partners were native Southerners, though both had long-standing ties to the region, nor is, it, is there evidence that either held strong anti-slavery views. William Strickland, born in England in 1850, had arrived in Mobile in 1839. And according to his own statement, his early savings for years were invested in slaves and real estate. When he went into the book business on his own account in 1844, he says that he sold my slave property and real estate as soon as possible and placed the proceeds in his business. Edwin Upson, who had joined Strickland business as junior partner on the 1st of July, 1854, was a northerner from Southington, Connecticut. Edwin's older brothers had come to Marion, Alabama in the late 1820s and had there made such a success in business that they had gradually brought down their brothers to share in it. At the time of the events that are the subject of this paper, Upson had lived 24 years in Alabama, had made a host of friends, and was all, to all intents and purposes, a Southerner. The events that led up to what came to be known as the Strickland Affair began, it seems, in fall of 1855, when several friends of the house called and wished to procure a copy of Fred Douglas's Bondage and Freedom, which had just then been announced. Strickland was consulted and agreed to order two copies, which, when they arrived, were placed on the shelves with books of a similar size in the rear of the store. When inventory was taken at the bookshop the following June, Strickland had books that had been kept in the back, including one of the copies of Douglas's book brought forward 
and placed on tables in the front of the store. Here is what happened next in Strickland's own words. A New, England, New Orleans gentleman dropped into the store wanting something to read as he went up river. In looking over the stock, he finds this copy of Douglas and remarks to my partner, do they allow you to keep such stuff in your bookstores here? His reply was, not exactly. The people here claim the right to read pretty much what they please. The gentleman replied that such books would not be allowed in New Orleans. Uh, he then bought the book, some other, some other book, and left. And my partner replaced the book in the back of our store. On his trip upriver, the visitor from New Orleans told a fellow traveler, the Reverend Mr. Hawthorne of Mobile, that he had seen Douglas's book at Strickland's store. And Hawthorne, in turn, mentioned this fact to his host, a Colonel Jones. Colonel Jones requested that Hawthorne purchase a copy and sent it to him. And when Hawthorne returned to Mobile, he sent his son-in-law, Dr. Cragen, to the Strickland store to buy the book. Cragen bought one copy for himself and had the other sent on to Colonel Jones. According to a sworn statement of another clerk, Franklin C. Babcock, who was employed by Strickland from November of 1854 to July 1856, the two copies of Douglas's book acquired on order were not typical of the store's stock. Here is his testimony. I took a complete list of their book stock in 1855 and also in 1856, and do positively state that the only books in their possession of incendiary character during the whole period of my stay with them was one copy of Autographs of Freedom and two copies of Fred Douglas's book, ordered in the fall of 1855, and one copy of The Key of Uncle Tom's Cabin all of which books were to the best of my knowledge and belief in their store when I left their employ on the 12th of July, 1856. There were some novels in their stock which had been condemned and were to be returned to New York with other goods. And there's Autographs of Freedom and there's The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, the two books along with the two copies of Frederick Douglass that were in their stock. As regards the store's stock generally, Strickland himself would later acknowledge that a few other anti-slavery works, especially novels, may have mistakenly been sold in ignorance. I alluded to the peculiar, peculiar difficulties in conducting the book business that as a rule, we had simply the title of a book to guide us as to its character. And questionably, we had no doubt sold many novels and other ephemeral books which may have contained abolition sentiments. Whenever it came to our knowledge that any book on hand was not fitted to circulate at the South, such books were at once wrapped up for return. We often had books consigned to us which we never should have ordered, that in the hurry of business, such books could easily get sold innocently. After the two copies of My Bondage and My Freedom had been sold to Dr. Cragen, who was well known to Strickland and considered a personal friend, another gentleman, a Mr. Harris, called and inquired after the book though no further copies were available in stock. Unfortunately, however, sometime in July or early August, 1856, the copy of the anti-slavery anthology, Autographs to Freedom, which had been in stock since at least June, 1854, was also sold. 
according to the account by the clerk, a Mr. Phillips, who made the sale, two young gentlemen entered the store ostensibly to purchase some Sabbath school books. While one was waited on by Upson, the other, a Mr. Woodcock, went directly to the shelves behind the middle of the store, took down a book and handed it to the clerk and then purchased it. After he paid for it, both gentlemen immediately left without purchasing any of the Sabbath school books. Matters quickly came to a head. On Tuesday afternoon, 12th of August, a friend reported to Strickland that he had been shown a book that had been sold in the store that he feared would lead to trouble. The following morning, another friend, a very prominent citizen, called to say that there was great excitement on nearby Royal Street in consequence of some books sold by the shop. He advised Strickland uh, to treat this as a serious matter and to see the gentleman who had the matter in hand as soon as possible. This Strickland did, and he was informed that a meeting was to be held that very evening to examine the matter. Strickland himself attended this meeting and was questioned at length, after which he gave a statement of his own. Among other things, he discussed Uncle Tom's cabin. I alluded to Uncle Tom's cabin, he said. We had utterly refused to sell it. We had two copies, I believe, sent to us, which were literally read to pieces by being passed from friend to friend whose curiosity had been excited, and I believe were men then in the room who had read one of them. And there's Uncle Tom's Cabin, if you're not familiar with it. Strickland's testimony was followed by that of his junior partner, Upson. On the following morning, Thursday, Mayor Withers of Mobile informed Strickland that he wished to examine him at his office about this matter. This examination was originally scheduled for Friday morning, but was then postponed to Saturday after Strickland requested that Mr. Hawthorne, whose purchase of a copy of My Bondage and My Freedom had set off the entire affair, also be present at the examination. Strickland also suggested that the mayor appoint a committee to examine his business records to get to the bottom of things. After he left his shop that Thursday evening, a committee did indeed call at the shop and gathered the firm's invoices, correspondence, etc. And the next morning, Friday, sent for more. Meanwhile, the whole affair was causing considerable excitement and unrest among the residents of Mobile. It was even reported that on Wednesday evening, a Negro of Dr. Woodcock's was found in engaged in reading one of these anti-slavery works. And on his refusing to tell where he procured it, was whipped till he confessed he got it at the store of Messrs. Strickland and Company. By Thursday evening, a mob had formed. As the Alabama correspondent of the New York Herald reported, Thursday night, a party started for the residence of Mr. Strickland and armed and equipped for a, quote, tightrope tight performance. But only by the prompt interposition of the more moderate portion of vigilance men the performance was postponed. On Friday, as it worked its way through the firm's business records, the examining committee discovered that Strickland had failed to be completely forthright in his account of his affairs at the Wednesday evening meeting. As Strickland later admitted, had it occurred to me I should have told them we ordered 50 copies of the cheap edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin several months after it was published, which were presented by myself gratuitously to our friends from the interior, 
who were exceeding anxious to get a copy and who I presumed were such as would appreciate the compliment. And there's Uncle Tom's Cabin, cheap edition. Oops. Furthermore, Strickland had failed to mention the copy of Stowe's Key to Uncle's Ta Cabin, which presumably was still remained in stock. These oversights, along with the discrepancy, perhaps a result of confusion in Strickland's testimony about the dates at which the offending books had been acquired, led the examining committee to conclude that the statements of Strickland and Upson in view of the existing facts of the case are little better, or little better than a tissue of falsehoods throughout. In his defense, Strickland would later claim that two other Mobile booksellers, J.K. Randall and Thomas J. Carver, were also implicated in the distribution of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And here's his statement. I would here beg leave to state that my friend, Mr. Randall, says here in New York that he sold Uncle Tom's Cabin freely. The Reverend Mr. Billborn told me in presence of the Harpers that he requested Mr. T.J. Carver to order a large number of copies and that when they arrived, he sent members of his congregation and others to purchase them. <clears throat> they were sold as openly as any other book in nearly all our Southern cities. But this defense made long after the fact proved to be too little and too late. And by Friday afternoon, the examining committee had prepared a report based on the evidence that it had gathered, which was adopted unanimously. Although it announced that the character of the evidence and of the books brought before the committee is such that it would be unsafe and dangerous to make public, the conclusion of the report was made public. The committee determined that these two persons are either on principal abolitionists and anxious to propagate their faith on that subject among slaves and slave owners, or they are unscrupulous and unprincipled speculators without any just sense of moral responsibility and willing to make money by the indiscriminate sale of any and every kind of book to any and everybody. In either case, they are dangerous persons in a slaveholding community and ought to be rejected from it. Three persons were then named to announce this conclusion to the offending partners and to inform them that unless they leave the city within five days, their personal safety could not be guaranteed. When that delegation proceeded to the Strickland store on Saturday morning, however, it discovered that the pair had already fled Mobile, Mobile the preceding afternoon. As Strickland writes, contrary to my own judgment, <clears throat> but with the advice I may almost say coercion of many friends, it was deemed prudent for me to absent myself from the city and take with me my partner. We crossed the bay by sailboat, in a small sailboat, rode in my buggy to Weatherford's and took the stage to Montgomery and so on by mail route to New York. On Wednesday of the following week, the 29th of August, the two partners now safely in New York, Strickland's wife, Anne, who had remained behind in Mobile, placed a notice in the Mobile Daily Advertising announcing that, it being determined to wind up the business of the house at the earliest possible moment, the said stock will be sold at invoice cost and to purchasers of any considerable amount, a discount from this rate will be made. 
By year's end, the partners had set themselves up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to carry on their business. Their stock in Mobile, which Strickland claimed to be worth about $60,000, was sold, at least in part, to Middleton and McMaster at about 50 cents on the dollar. But what else they were able to salvage from Mobile is not known. Strickland claimed to have another 20,000 doom there, and both of them must have abandoned their homes and any other real estate and property that they owned. Upson's daughter was later to state that the total loss was not less than $150,000. The whole affair was widely reported in the press, North and South, and another paper might explore at greater length the heated rhetoric that was used. Those sympathetic to the South commented on the careful, deliberate, and thorough investigation that was made by some of Mobile's best, calmest, and most influential citizens with the goal of protecting the community by the prompt suppression of the evil. An editorial in the New York Daily Tribune gives another view of the matter. Their scripture arguments are like Gibraltar, unassailable. Their slaves are perfectly happy, their minds too inferior to appreciate freedom, their enterprise too dull to be awakened by the noble example of a brother slave. And yet when booksellers procure and sell to white people, Fred Douglas's bondage and freedom is denounced as incendiarism. Mob law is introduced and the poor incendiaries at a great loss expelled from the country. But to close my account of the affair, let me present you with a second advertisement taken from the front page of the 27th of August issue of the New York Tribune and placed by the publishers of My Bondage and My Freedom, the book that lay behind the whole affair. And there's the front page. The advertisement is that one. And there you have freedom of speech in behalf of, so uh, that's my story. Uh, I had noted a few things that I'd love to discuss with you that this story opens up for me. Uh, one is the whole question of distribution of books, especially anti-slavery books in the South. Uh, of course it happened. We know that Uncle Tom's Cabin was read in the South, but this gives some specifics about how, to what extent, and uh, questions about was it ordered, was it sent, how, how it was sent, as well as the interesting thing of being in the front or the back of the store, which I think is an interesting thing to think about. The second question, of course, is freedom of speech and censorship. Who can read what? Uh, what were the legal implications of uh, this? Was, was this book really illegal to sell? There certainly were strong social and physical forces against selling it. Uh, a number of copies we learned were given away. So does buying it make it have a different status than receiving it as a gift? Um, and how dangerous are books anyway? And the final thing that I think are interesting, well, two more things. One of course is the whole question of anti-slavery books during the 1850s in the book trade, uh, the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and I think proving that there was a, a large national market for anti-slavery works. Uh, you can see in the ads that I showed you that its nature was not concealed. It was a selling point. And these publishers were, of course, the same publishers of 12 Years a Slave. And it's clear they had, uh, in various ways, uh, connections with Stowe and Jewett. Um, 
And then of course, the other final thing that interests me about this, which I haven't covered at all here, is how this book relates to Frederick Douglass's own life and anti-slavery campaign. How does it compare to the narrative which came out 1845? Uh, are, is it really a slave narrative in the same sense as the narrative? Certainly the, narr the earlier, which was published and distributed by the American Anti-Slave Society reached its readers in a very different way than through the bookshops of the South. So those are some things that interest me about this story, but I wanna hear from you. Thank you, Michael, for that really um, wonderful talk. And I'll just remind you again that you can um, just use the little raise hand uh, reaction button or for some of you, it's, it's in the participants panel. That uh, depends what version of Zoom you have. Um, so the floor is open for, for questions. You can put your hand up at any point and you'll get in, in the queue. I should apologize that this technology is all very new to me. It all worked just, just fine, I thought. Good. Marcy, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Michael, it's nice to see you. Um, <laughs> so unsurprisingly, I have a David Walker connection to make. Um, this is uh, wonderful to hear about. It's really interesting um, because I've largely confined myself to the 1830s <laughs> in thinking about in incendiary print circulating. And so I was just looking really quickly to see if Alabama was among the states that passed um, laws banning so-called incendiary print in the wake of Walker's appeal. And my <laughs> quick searches were inconclusive, um, but surrounding states certainly did. But this really remarkably um, resembles the Burrett affair in I think late 1829 or 1830, where um, copies of Walker's appeal were discovered um, not in a bookseller's hands, but in a newspaper publisher's hands in Milledgeville, Georgia. And so there was, and it, it plays out almost exactly the same way. There's an investigation, they debate about whether or not to report it. And then um, they uh, basically in, in the course of this happening in the mob gathering and whatnot, um, Bert decides to flee North as well. So um, this just as a kind of context is, is they're, they're pulling from the same playbook and op operating off the same either laws or customs that were put in place directly in response to Walker's appeal, but also the, of course, the um, Anti-Slavery Society's Great Postal Campaign of 1835. So to hear about this still having force in the 1850s is um, not completely surprising, but it's it's a it's a straight line back to, to Walker's appeal. So I, I was just wondering if, if, yeah, if you were, had drawn some of those connections back yourself or um, if, if you were largely confined to kind of post Uncle Tom's Cabin and thinking about this. I, I know about the earlier incident. I think in part, <clears throat> I mean, I think the question of being in a newspaper office versus being in a bookstore is, is important. But I'm also interested in this whole question of, uh, you know, this idea that, I mean, I didn't quote, I only gave the one quote, but that if you were the right person, you of course could read this. And there was no sense that uh, that uh, you would hold it back. And I don't, I suspect that's not so true of Walker's appeal. But uh, I mean, the newspaper editors needed to read it in order to respond. But, uh, you know, w were ministers ordering it for their congregations? And so on. So I, th and that I think is the, inter I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, all the who are about Zeus books now, uh, you know, who gets to read it, who doesn't get to read it, is it dangerous to read it? And, you know, is this cancel culture? But yes, I mean, 
it, I mean, I'm, I mean, obviously this tension goes back a long time. Dan and Susan. So I have a very naive, as you might imagine, economic history sort of question to ask of this. Can you tell us a little bit about Mobile and the place of a bookstore in Mobile of this size in the uh, Southern book trade? I, I want to contextualize your story. Um, and I'm having a hard time doing it just on the contents of the story. I think uh, the amount of money that we're talking about is huge. If he had, if he really had sixty thousand dollars of stock, uh -huh. that's a lot of money in stock. And he was reputed, uh, or you know, he was reputed to be the largest bookstore in the South. Now I don't believe that completely. Uh, I think, uh, but he was certainly important. And I think Mobile was important along with Charleston and New Orleans. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been able to find the goods on him in the Dunn records at Harvard, except later in his life when he was in Milwaukee. Did he turn up in the Techner and Fields uh, account books? Uh, I. I have I ha I can't answer that off the he was not a big player, uh -huh. then. Uh -huh. but Tickner and Free, well, uh, I'd have to check that. It's a small detail. Okay, thanks. But uh, yeah, Jordan, go ahead. Thank you, and um, Michael, it's always such a pleasure to think Good. of you and to, to discover what you discovered. Um. The thing that I was just wondering about, and this is maybe not the crux of the matter, but it's um, it's the association between Douglas and Stowe and this kind of category of, of abolitionist literature. It seems to me that in the North, um, this category would not be quite so homogenous in part because um, it mattered to abolitionists whether things were being published by abolitionist, um, you know, um, authorized presses or not. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is a kind of crossover phenomenon um, it also certainly matters to us in the 21st century whether you know the person writing about slavery has experience with slavery or not. But it seems that again, like in the North, in the antebellum North, like that would have mattered somewhat too. So I guess I, I'm interested in like the creation uh, of this kind of genre of abolitionist literature, which seems to exist as like all of the things that we don't like. And I don't know if if this is relevant to your story, but it was just something I was wondering about. I'm not sure I understand all the things we don't like. Uh, the Southerners um, don't like okay. um, in, in your account. Sorry, I'm being glib. Um, I'm increasingly coming to the conclusion that uh, you know Uncle Tom's Cabin was a key work because uh, anti-slavery works before Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, were not published by the regular book trade. They were published by the anti-slavery societies and circulated among their depots and agents and so on. Or they were self-published in some kind of scheme. And, you know, the story of the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin is that uh, you know, mainstream publishers like Philip Sampson and company turned it down because they were afraid of losing their Southern audience, which was substantial. I mean, the South was a large audience. And I think Uncle Tom's Cabin proved, I mean, it proved all kinds of things, but it proved that there was a national market for anti-slavery works. And I think publishers were looking for books to try to ride that wave. And I think that's, uh, you know, that is uh, 12 Years a Slave is one example of that. And as I say, the same publishers 
actually, I believe, approached Frederick Douglass and said, would you write a, a biography, which is quite different from the narrative in many ways, both in its appearance and also in the text. And, um, you know, they basically, I think, commissioned him to write it, to try to fill that niche. And I think you see that over and over again. Um, so in that sense, it's circulating, I think, in a different way than earlier anti-slavery works were. And that's what interests me, one of the things that interests me about it. I'm not sure if that gets to your question or not. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, Philip Benedict? You, you need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, still not used to uh, many Zoom conferences, believe it or not, but that's what retirement will do to you. Uh, I'm a historian of 16th century France and just now reading about the regulation of the book trade and the execution of uh, a not insignificant number of booksellers in the early French Reformation. Uh, so the details of this story were very uh, interesting indeed. Uh, but uh, as one who doesn't know the American history, I, I appreciate more context uh, if either you or others uh, could provide it. One person in the chat asks, did Alabama law at the time make it criminal to publish a book? But what was there formal regulation of any sort uh, of the book trade that would come into play here? What struck me in the uh, uh, narration of the sequence of events was the creation of the investigating committee uh, and the examination of this case. Uh, clearly, it would appear that we have some sort of crowd action outside the law without legal officials directly involved, although perhaps they were. Uh, could that have been the case? But was the formation of an investigati investigating committee a standard part of uh, popular justice, uh, a lynching, uh, or driving people out of town on a rail, whatever uh, forms of persecution uh, might have been uh, involved? And what's also striking when one looks at this through the lens of studies of crowd action and popular violence of different sorts, uh, is that there appears to be in the crowd a certain implicit moral economy of book selling. Booksellers shouldn't sell just anything that can make money. They should only sell books of a certain moral quality. Is it appropriate to speak of such an implicit moral economy governing booksellers uh, at the time? Those are all good questions. Uh, and one reason that's one thing that's holding me back from thinking about publishing this is I would I need to go to Mobile to read the newspapers there, which have not been scanned, to see their side. Of, I mean, I'm really using Northerners' account side of their argument, but I think you put your finger on several interesting things. Uh, it's not clear to me, and I don't know that there were any laws broken. And Mar this is Marcy asked this. Uh, and there certainly is a sense there that, uh, that again, qualified people, whatever that means, are <clears throat> allowed to read something that won't harm them because they're too intelligent or too whatever, even if it represents a position to which they don't agree. Uh, and the same, I think, is true to a less, well, on pornography. Pornography circulates perfectly well among the right people in probably expensive limited editions and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and I do know that, I mean, it was very hard uh, in the in the 19th century to actually get sent to jail for either writing or publishing a lot of pornography. I mean, it does happen all the time, uh, but uh, certainly not the people who usually end up are the people selling it on the street. 
neither the producers nor the sort of mainstream bookshops that had it in the back or under the counter. Uh, but, uh, you know, whether, you know, I mean, if one were to imagine that uh, this had gone to trial in a formal court all the way up to the Supreme Court or to even the state Supreme Court, whether there was anything illegal, I don't know. But it, on the other hand, as you point out, and I think is important, they make a big difference between mob censorship and this kind of orderly censorship that they're trying to opposed to it. They were acting lawfully and in a organized, what, correct manner. And I think that if, when I do find, finally read their accounts, that will be what they stress, that this wasn't, uh, you know, that this was a, a, a grown up responsible response to something, to, to, to men that had lied to them you know, that seems very important that they, the testimony was wrong, even if it was only in minor ways. But yes, I mean, this whole question of, uh, you know, of social control, and I think social control is very important here in both what the bookstore stocks and what the community is willing to allow to circulate in its community, and that goes all the way back to publishers who would turn down works that they felt, not necessarily that they were illegal, but that they were not proper. Let's go to um, John Pollock. You were next, John. Well, sure. Thanks. I Although I might just take advantage and read the chat here for a second, because there are some, I think, some folks are pushing you a little further on the legal stuff, Michael, and um, seeing if you really do know anything about any legal grounds, um, or I guess in other other states too, might be, um, if there's anything more to say there. And, and Jessica Linker poses a question that sort of relates to mine. She says, what's the sum total of what we know about Strickland? I was also gonna ask you the particular source that I think Philip was kind of mentioning too, the one that uh, uses that phrase, dangerous persons in a slaveholding community, the sort of moral, is that Strickland's uh, account? I can't, uh, and I, I can't remember. And uh, anyway, that, so that, is, that is Strickland quoting the conclusion to the report yeah. written by the examining committee. So they really did write a report and we have it or we have it through him. <clears throat> well, the sources here are interesting. I mean, what we have is once they were, once Strickland and Upson were in New York, they spent some time in the public prints uh, defending themselves. And Strickland wrote a long statement of facts. And that uh, is reprinted widely in the newspapers. I have no idea where it appeared first. And he quotes a tremendous number of documents, include, you know, and most of my paper is drawing on that. Uh, not, not all of it, but so he's quoting, as I say, the full report was never published. Right. Because the nature of the titles were so dangerous to the public. But the conclusion yeah, is, the conclusion is that he was, I, I can't personally, I can't quite make out Strickland. Uh, he was not particular, po particularly popular in Milwaukee where he continued in business for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, though those were difficult years in the book trade. Uh, and there's at least one report that I can't track down that there had been some complaints about his business practices a couple of years ago, earlier than this event. And it's clear that 
uh, he was set up. There were people who didn't really like him that were trying to get him. And it's also, I think, clear that he was not particularly pushing anti-slavery works. He was supplying them to people who uh, had asked him if he could get them for him. Yeah, the whole question of the gift economy is super interesting. And uh, yeah, um, I, I just, just quickly, there's a lot of hands up, but I just wanted to say there was one interesting thing that came out about the difference between Mobile and New Orleans. Right, the sort of like, oh, we ne you'd never see that stuff in New Orleans. Sort of the sense of not all big Southern cities are the same in terms of the books that that circulate. And just other quickly, I still I thought Jordan had an interesting I, point there that we, you know, it's a, you could make this fun argument about how the South makes uh, makes the category of abolitionist makes the genre it was kind of a, a, a nice literary argument to make, right, Jordan? Anyway, I'm done. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I. Okay. Well, we have a lot of hands up. So let's take. I did. I just wanted to read one uh, maybe quick answer to um, Ashley Cataldo's question in the chat. She's asking whether copies of um, the book, here she means, I think, Douglas's book, um, appear. Do copies appear in library catalogs in the Deep South from this period? Which is an interesting question. I don't know if you know the answer I offhand. Have, I, I have no idea. Um, I mean, uh, published catalogs, uh, you know, didn't come out annually or anything. So if, if in the 1870s, a Southern Library had a copy, it's difficult to know when they acquired it. But in general, I, I would think not. Let's go to Donna Rilling. Hi. Um, so uh, two things. One thing that really struck me was the business about, and I wondered to what degree it might be true or just made up, um, about the enslaved man who was reading uh, the, the, um, this book, because it strikes me as, well, it does go back to the legal question, not that the legal question is the entire, or legal questions, that's not the entire thing, but um, is literacy uh, banned for for black people, including free blacks um, in Alabama? I would guess teaching literacy is banned, but you know I don't I don't know. <laughs> and but that really struck me, and I wondered to what degree you didn't. Uh, and I would have emphasized that I think a little bit more here because it it really seems like the biggest fear um, that comes out of this is is that this is getting into the hands of enslaved people in some way or another. And um, now, oh, and this is also pressing you on, okay, you've said that you don't think that, that Strickland was particularly anti-slavery, but he does seem to step into the New York context very quickly. And I wondered if you think that there's more connection between him and some of these um, abolitionist publishers and abolitionists in New York than, than might be apparent at this point. So those are my two questions. And I'm sorry, my cats are very distracting right now because they're that's, people no, that's no problem. <laughs> uh, the, I think that the thing about a slave reading it is a red herring. It's word on the street, it disappears. It's not part of the report from the examining committee. And if it was a slave, it was Woodcock's slave, and Woodcock is the person whose son bought the book, and I think was trying to set up Strickland. So I, I, I don't give it much credit. I also don't particularly uh, think he was uh, tied into the anti-slavery network. I mean, his he seems to have been buying his books through Harper, which were not an anti-slavery concern. I mean, quite, quite, quite clearly not. And uh, I mean, I think he was being used, um, or this incident was being used to drum up what support for the Republican Party and the campaign 
and for uh, anti-slavery stuff, but I don't get any sense that you know he was a driving force in that. And he had owned slaves, there's no question. And there's some report that his cook, even at this time, was a slave. Well, is, was that the foundation of his fortune or the presumed fortune that would allow him to get the $60,000 value of stock? He, he was born in England. He apprenticed as a binder, I think in England, but it's not clear. Uh, when he moved to Mobile, he invested any money he had. And, you know, Mobile was a growing, I mean, Mobile was the only, as somebody writes in the chat, the only saltwater port mm -hmm. in Alabama and was a growing town. Uh, and he was probably playing the real estate market a little bit, as well as buying and selling slaves. So, um, but as, a, as I say, the key to this would be to find the done records, the credit records, but this is very early for those. And uh, this is in the South. It's not, you know, in New York where they would have had a network, a better network to catch up. So I can't, I can't really say that. Uh, but I do think that the account of the slave reading the book is, uh, is a red herring. And certainly there's no suggestion that a slave bought the book from him. Thank you. Hey, um, Peter, go ahead. Thanks very much, Michael. It was really a fascinating talk. Uh, I've got three very quick questions. One I think you know, is perhaps just more of a comment, which is, um, to the question of the importance of books. And Jonathan Dollimore in his book on censorship, a much more general book, uh, argues really that people who want to censor books tend to take books much more seriously. And that people, the usual arguments in defense against pornography, for instance, is that it really doesn't affect people very sexually. Real pornography does, but literature doesn't. You know, so that becomes a sort of literary defense in the 20th century, whereas, you know, the anti, the, 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 the pro-censorship people really say books are going to destroy society. And that seems to be what these Southern people are saying, you know, which I think is rather fascinating that, you know, it me makes for an inter more interesting argument that a, a situation of censorship, as in Eastern Europe, for instance, writers have an extraordinary power. Uh, and authority, as they did in South Africa, too, for that matter. Um, so in conditions of censorship, very often the kind of liberal argument tends to be a rather weak one as, a as against the actual revolutionary potential, you might say, of literature. Um, but the two questions I really have about, first of all, a talk that Peg Jacob gave, gave about the way in, about the back room, essentially, and the way in which the back room changes historically. And what interests me is what would be put in the back room. And Peg Jacob's argument for the sort of uh, 17th century, 18th century, is that you put sedition and pornography together they were sold, you know, in the same way. And the Marquis, you know, Dassard, for instance, is being sold uh, next to uh, Machiavelli. Uh, you know, that's and also they often go into the libraries in the same way. So I'm interested to know literally what categories there are, what's changed in the 19th century, what kinds of things you put together, and whether anti-slavery really does become a kind of key um, discourse of putting other texts together as dangerous books in the South, you know, what, what, what other things might go with that. Um, and the, 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 re the related question to that is about non-commercial books and the significance of religious publishing, and, you know, which you know so much about, but, you know, you think about the missionary societies and or the, the vast, you know, the interest in stereotype, for instance, which is being pushed often by non-commercial groups to distribute, you know, throughout the world on a global market. And I'm wondering to what extent, I was fascinated by the notion of 50 books that people are, um, you know, ordering. And Zach also has written about this, congregations that, you know, pu public publishers are often congregations that actually put the money up 
you know, just for a sermon for their for their preacher or whatever. So I'm thinking that this is part of a seems to be a very big story in which anti-slavery may have a huge significance as part of a kind of religious campaign that that will include, of course, um, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, often being marketed, whether as fiction or not fiction, it often doesn't seem to make much difference as effectively religious books uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a radical um, you know, direction. So just some questions and thoughts. I can't, no, I don't know that I can remember all of them. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I, am, I agree, I'm fascinated by the idea that books can be dangerous. Yeah, because we all write books, and we were just happy if someone reads them. We don't mm -hmm. expect them to to do anything. Yeah, though we like to think they would. But you know, poor Salman Rushdie, when suddenly his book was death or life. You know, it's just a novel, and you know, so, but uh, the back of the store. I remember you brought up. And I, that, of course, is just where inventory is stored. Mm -hmm. It would, be, would, I'm quite sure, have been stored by publisher, not by subject in any way. At the front of the store was, uh, I mean, I think of it sort of like shoe stores, or at least how shoe stores used to be before they were all virtual, where there were shoes out front, but the back was and uh, the other issue here I keep coming on, and I think this is true about the religious thing you said, I think that, uh, you know, you, everybody wanted to read Uncle Tom's Cabin. I mean, Uncle Tom's Cabin is special. But if you were a Southerner, you would have had, you know, can I order a copy? Should I buy a copy in public? And so I think the idea that the minister orders 50 copies, that's his saying, go ahead, you can do it. And my status will make it all right. Uh, and I think that's, you know, I also think it's important uh, that in the sort of conclusion to the report, they keep wanting to switch away about censorship, you know, anti-slavery books are bad and say, well, they're bad people because they, they're they either anti-slavery or they're very, very greedy money walkers and they lied to us. Uh, they don't really want to get into this question of, are we really banning a book, I think? especially when it comes down to a specific book. So, uh, I mean, these are complicated issues and, and we don't know what went on in their mind. And until now, as I say, I don't really have their side, though I think I have some ideas of what that their side was. Okay, let's go to Larry and then Jerry. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed this uh, uh, this presentation very much. Uh, my dissertation and first book was uh, a history of pro-slavery literature, and, uh, and it occurred to me as you were talking, uh, there, there were so few bookstores outside of these metropolitan areas, but yet everybody who wrote uh, uh, something in defense of slavery had all of the anti-slavery literature and, and so did free blacks. They had the anti-slavery literature and it's just uh, there must have been uh, another way that had nothing to do with bookstores uh, for this literature to, to be distributed. And uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just assuming that the, the people who wrote defenses of slavery who cited anti-slavery literature and abolitionist literature line by line and paragraph by paragraph to respond to it, they must have ordered copies from the booksellers. I mean, from the, from the publishers uh, uh, because there certainly were plenty of them. And I would, I would imagine as far as the libraries go, most of the, the people who defended slavery who were on 
uh, faculties at universities, the copies of the books were in their own personal libraries and not in the, the college library. The college library was considered something for students to read and use. Uh, as far as the, the, uh, uh, the laws about distribution, there were a number of cases uh, in uh, the state that I know best in the South is North Carolina, uh, in which there was uh, uh, anti-slavery literature distributed. But those laws basically were concerned about copies of, of anti-slavery literature being handed to slaves and for slaves to be able to read them. And the cases that, that I know of that went to trial uh, in North Carolina, the law was about distribution to slaves and they could never prove that the people who had this anti-slavery literature ever even saw a slave. Uh, they were basically distributing the literature to Quakers, uh, to other religious people who, who wanted to keep up with the, with the literature. So, so you re really raise a lot of very interesting questions to, in my mind about how the anti-slavery literature got distributed. And I can only guess that the, the authors bought these books directly from the publishers or a bookseller, uh, a traveling bookseller. A lot of, uh, there were a lot of traveling booksellers as well. So I don't know, I just I have more questions than anything else about how this would all work, but it's a fabulous paper. I, I wouldn't underestimate the bookstores. Ah. I, first of all, I think there probably were more of them than you think. And you'll note that, uh, you know, Colonel Jones gets his copy from the bookstore and that the 50 copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin were bought by the bookseller for his friends upriver. So, yeah. I mean, he's really serving as a kind of middleman here. And I think it's probably not so often that a individual writes to a publisher. Now, some of the businessmen may have had agents in New York for their cotton or whatever, and have asked an agent there to supply them with specific books. Hmm. But again, I, I think, I mean, one of the big distinctions between my bondage and my freedom and the narrative is that it was a book for sale in bookstores mm -hmm. and not by traveling agents or, or anything like that. So I think I wouldn't underestimate the bookstores. But, but I'm, I'm also thinking about these states and places where there are so few bookstores. I mean, there was no bookstore in North Carolina that I, that I know of in this period of time. And yet ministers and, and, uh, uh, the faculty at the colleges and so on did have copies of these books. Uh, but like you say, uh, a books, a bookseller or a bookstore could have uh, bought copies to send to those people. Yeah. Also, well, let me write to me. Uh -huh. And the earliest directory of bookstores we have is 1859. I'll send you a list of uh, North Carolina bookstores in 1859. There were plenty. Fantastic. I would love to know that. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry, go ahead. Thank Jerry. you. This, this was wonderful and um, really wonderful. So questions uh, about sales and distribution again. Um, you know, I think you said the Strickland was quoted about those 50 copies that they were distributed gratuitously, um, I believe was the language. Right. So I'm puzzled by what that, what you think that means. Um, and he said that also, again, if I'm recalling what you said, that he had two copies of Uncle Tom's Cabins that he never sold, but that were read by so many people that they fell apart. Um, so what was going on there? Was it, I mean, obviously it's, it's against a bookseller's interest to just pass books around to so many people that they fall apart? And did, did he have a lending library or was there some kind of coterie um, that he was passing the, the book around to? Um, 
Yeah, so I, I was just puzzled. I mean, everything, everything else is described as having been sold, including the key to Uncle Tom's cabin he sold. He sold the copies of my Bonnie. Oh, yeah, it was still in stock, as far as I know. Stock, yeah, but but the uncle, the two copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin were not sold. Uh, the the basically, what happened is that he ordered two books for, for specific customers who uh -huh. came to him and asked if he could get it for them. Those those two copies were not sold to those two people. They remained in his stock. I think by mistake, after doing inventory, one of them got to the front of the store that was discovered. And then both copies were sold as I discussed. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I may have misunderstood or-, or uh, Yes, I think- I thought I he think, said he had two copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin that-, that, that that's, 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 that's something that uh, uh, it was very typical for publishers upon publishing any new book to send copies out uh, at the time of publication uh, without an order. And that's what I think those two copies were. And if the bookseller returned them within a certain length of time, usually six months, then they weren't charged for them. But if they kept them, then they were charged for them and they were for sale. I think that's the two copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin. They just came okay. along with a whole order. Everybody was talking about Uncle Tom's Cabin. I can't imagine that the idea they had two copies in his store didn't attract crowds to read it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he ever sold them. I think people came to the store and said, can I see this? See it. None of them would buy it because of peer pressure, but they all wanted to know what it said. I see. And then he then he had all these people up river saying, what's all this talk about Uncle Tom's cabin? And he bought 50 copies and he says he gave them away. And that may have to do with the idea that if he wasn't a merchant, he wasn't selling them for money, he was satisfying a desire for interaction. I mean, what actually happened, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it was customer relations. It was, a, it was a cheap book. He didn't give them the expensive copy. He gave them the one that was, I forget, it was a 25 cent book. So he would have got his 40% discount off that. It wasn't a huge uh, expense for him. So, uh, and that's, you know, it's very interesting to, me, interesting to me who've been working on distribution. All of these things he mentions are very sort of familiar. Uh, you know, many people in the North would have gotten on sale, as they say, more than two copies. They would have gotten, you know, a dozen copies or something. Uh, but, uh, I think that's, the, I, I don't, yeah, it seems very straightforward to me. And I think it was a defense saying, I didn't okay. sell it. The only book, the only time that he real, really sale, sold copies was after people discovered that he had them. And it seems in all those cases, at least from his point of view, he was set up. You know, the, the, the two young men uh, they come in pretending to buy Sabbath sale, school books. And while one's distracting the Upson, the other goes and grabs one and comes and pays for it and they leave. Without, and I think, you know, there's no sense that when he bought it, that, any, that anybody in the store knew exactly what it was, or the clerk who sold it didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. It's so. interesting that it seems an acceptable defense to say I'm not selling. I mean, it's sort of against that, you know, the notion that it's the unscrupulous speculator problem that seems to be as as risky almost as having abolitionist literature. It's the selling, right? So somehow giving stuff away for free, even if it's 
even if it's bad stuff is is a way to get off the hook it's kind of interesting if that's really a if that claim is a defense yeah. well i mean i don't i don't know i mean i think it's just uh I mean, it also raises the question of who's he defending himself from at that point since he's writing this later, but it's like his claim that we had simply, I wrote this down, we had simply the title of a book to guide us as to its character. That's a great claim. I assume you don't believe a word of that. Oh, I think, I think in many cases that's true. Ah, okay. I mean, you know, if you read the bestseller list in the New York Times, from the titles, can you, you know, not the fi nonfiction, but the fiction. Sure. Can you know what they're about? <laughs> no, you can't. You presumably know what a key to but, Uncle Tom's Cabin is about. Though. Yeah. Well, he certainly knew Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> and, and he bought a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. He did sell that book. Well, he didn't necessarily, uh, he did not sell that book. It was in his stock. And it's, again, he could easily foresee, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> to tell the truth here, the key to Uncle Tom's cabin was a bomb. <laughs> and it sat on the shelves of all bookstores all over the nation for years and years and years into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, he could easily have been sent two copies of that when it came out too. Mm. And it was still in his stock. Uh, I, I had a question, Michael, about the advertisements in the North, which I think are fascinating too. Oh, you the, know that that um, that dichotomy between the bookseller as a kind of propagandist for the books he's selling or just unscrupulously selling any book at all. I mean, that goes back to the beginning of, of print, certainly, I don't know enough about the pre-print period to say, but I, you know, probably before, since there are bookshops, I feel like that's a tension that people see. And I think you could, there's something similar, there's a tension in those advertisements in the North, which are, you know, making hay off of this incident in the South, um, clearly to sell these books, not necessarily because they're advancing the cause of the abolitionist movement. And I wondered, because of what you were saying about the difference between Douglas's two books, right? The different context, the different place they had in the circulation of books in the period. Was there any tension between the abolitionist societies in the North and booksellers and publishers in the North who were now, you know, we're moving into this material, as you say, post Uncle Tom's Cabin, but not necessarily with the purest, you know, the purest of motives always. I mean, those, those newspaper ads, to me anyway, they, they, are very, they read, you know, they're making a lot of sensation out of this event in the South so that you'll buy the book and they tell you exactly how to do that. They're not, they're not particularly pious about, about the political agenda that they have. And I, I just wondered if, if there was any tension between booksell, you know, if that same dichotomy where the ab did abolitionist societies ever see these booksellers in the North as kind of unscrupulously, yeah, they'll make money off of this because it happens to, this time happens to be abolitionists, but who knows what they'll do next month if they get a hold of a good selling book that's, you know, pro-slavery. I, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, we could go into Frederick Douglass and his relationships with the anti-slavery societies. Uh, uh, and I think at least in this, I mean, J.P. Jewett, the publisher of Uncle Tom, and uh, these firms in North, upstate New York, they reorganize all the time, uh, were certainly strong anti-slavery firms. Uh, they, uh, you know, 12 slaves, 12 years a slave and so on. Uh, and I think, I mean, there was also, of course, remember a campaign going on and Sumner had just been beaten on the Senate floor and bloody Kansas was, I mean, you know, this is, this is a big issue and there's clearly on one side, not the other. They are certainly also selling books, but they're selling the right books from the Northerners point of view. Uh, so uh, I don't see, 
uh, and they're selling in different, I mean, the anti-slavery societies aren't selling books in these venues or advertising on the front page of the New York Herald. Uh, but yes, of course, I mean, they're also in the business of making money. Though, uh, I, I mean, I mean, Jewett goes bankrupt in 1857. So uh, it's not like they made huge amounts out of this. So I don't- Let's I don't go know. to, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just gonna get Lynn in before we run out of time. I know. We'd... Hi, Michael, thank you so much. That was great. It's really a fascinating topic. I had a question about those two copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin. I'm sorry to get back to it. I sure. had a couple of other things that got covered, but I was just wondering, where, where do you think those would have been? I mean, because he wouldn't have necessarily put them out for people just to look at. I would presume maybe they would have to ask for them or something and then people might stand there and read them or, but I'm just trying to figure out, do they, are they in the back and have to be requested or do you think they were sitting out on a table? Your, well, uh, <laughs> in general, uh, I think in the 19th century, just, I mean, I like the comparison to shoe stores, which I've used a lot. Uh, you know, you go to a shoe store, if you want to see a certain thing, you ask a clerk. But there's something out there already that, there are, that, there are things you that they have that shoe. They don't, they don't put out all the shoes, but they have a shoe that. Right, and I have, I mean, we have no information on Uncle Tom's Cabin in particular. But it does seem that books like that, and remember, Uncle Tom's Cabin is different from any other book at this period. There's no other book that's like it. Yeah. Uh, I, I would guess that uh, probably it was not just sitting there waiting for people to pick up. But once somebody had it, they would pass it to the next person and they'd sit, I mean, you know. Yeah, they'd sit there and they'd maybe read it right in the shop, right? Of Is course, I think probably. I mean, he never sold it, so who yeah, took it home? Right. Yeah. I, they were reading it. I mean, shops were like that. So, uh, but, you know, where they stored it, I, I, I don't know. But we do know that, you know, most of this stuff was in the back. And it, it seems at least plausible that the copy of My Bondage, My Freedom that ended up up front wasn't put there specially. It was put there because during the inventory, they made a thing, take the books in the back and put, you know, yeah, yeah. put them out front. So if, the, if it had stayed in the back, none of this would have happened. Oh, I, I don't think that's, that's necessarily true. <laughs> Somebody could have, I mean, could have come in and said, Do, can you get me this book? And then word would get out. I mean, you know, as I say, I think there's some bad blood that's not, yeah. that's there. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I think we've kept Michael on long enough. We're approaching supper time. So uh, join me in thanking him and come back next Monday. Peter will be speaking next Monday. Uh, on who is God. So you'll want to come back to, to find that out, certainly so close to Passover and Easter. Thanks again, Michael, for, for a terrific talk. Thank you all.